All right. Well, again, uh, good evening, everyone. We greet you in love, and it's uh, wonderful to see you all. And uh, we look forward to a, a reprieve from the world tonight as we talk about the things of God, and uh, but also a glimpse uh, into the things that the Lord has in store for us. Uh, so it's a reprieve for now, but we're looking forward to so many wonderful things in the Lord. And uh, my, my topic tonight is empty, then fill. And so I'll explain a little bit more about how I came up with that and what that means. Um, and I've got some slides for our class tonight as well. But we, uh, I, some time ago, maybe a couple of years ago, I was uh, in a quiet place praying, doing some, uh, uh, some reading of scripture. And the Lord laid that thought upon my heart, what actually came to me was to empty ourselves of the world and fill ourselves with the things of God. And so that's uh, our theme tonight. And I, uh, I've kind of mentioned that in some other, another class or, or two, perhaps, but uh, I, um, I wanted to try and spend some, some time this evening talking about how we might do that. And so uh, you know, it's a good, uh, I think, a good goal for to shoot for, um, to aim for in life. And so let me go ahead and start my slides here. And uh, <clears throat> to get us started here, um, you know, I have, uh, you know, it's not easy to empty ourselves of things. And uh, it's a sacrifice. And so... Uh, starting there in that, you know, that part of the lesson, that's really the first step. And, and so maybe we can spend some time thinking about uh, what that means and how we, how we go about accomplishing that. Um, and really, I think it's a choice, uh, right? It's sort of a fork in the road because, uh, and, and, and I guess we could certainly look at this topic from the perspective of someone new uh coming into the church coming into uh service of god but i think it's also something that you can look at from the perspective of uh, having served god for many years because it's an ongoing thing it's an ongoing struggle between flesh and spirit and many times through different phases in life there are things perhaps that creep in um and, you know, it, it kind of strikes me today because, you know, it was maybe a, a rougher day, uh, one of those days for me where things weren't going the right way. And so I'm thankful tonight that not only are we to empty ourselves of the world and of sin, but also of the burdens and the things that would rob our joy, the fears and concerns. And I, I don't want to be too harsh and say, you know, those things are, are sinful, but, you know, maybe they're lacking faith at times. You know, the, the burdens and concerns of life are one of those things that can creep in at different times of life, even as we're well into our covenant with the Lord. And so tonight, um, we're really putting forth, uh, it's kind of a stern topic. I, some of the scriptures I came up with uh, for this, you know, they're very bold. And, and so we're, we're facing, uh, again, this, this choice, this, this uh, turning point uh, many times where we have to surrender that which we're holding on to, and, uh, but not forgetting that beautiful step number two, that other half of the lesson tonight to uh, once you've given something up that's not good for you, that you would fill that void with something that is good. And so uh, as trade-off if you will, and something that's uh, a, a beautiful trade, right? We, we surrender something that's not good for us, although our flesh argues with us sometimes and wants us to hold on, even sometimes to miserable things, right? We've talked about classes recently on anger and different things that we, for whatever reason, latch on to. Um, but we, we can surrender things that are not pleasant, and beneficial to us in exchange for something beautiful, something that is. And so, um, you know, it's like that scripture, choose ye this day. There's an urgency 
uh, in that statement that we would, when confronted with options that are good and bad, that we would be quick to choose the Lord, that we would choose with all our heart uh, those things which he has um, uh, you know, put before us as, as good, as, as righteousness. So uh, that's, uh, we'll start here with step one, the empty phase of, of our, our lesson. And uh, again, I, I, it is a sacrifice, and I have a couple of verses here on sacrifice. And uh, the first one is uh, in 2 Nephi, and it says, Behold, he offered himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. So, you know, the topic of sacrifice is, is a significant and uh, fundamental topic. And how beautiful that it starts with the sacrifice of all sacrifices. Um, you know, talk about setting the bar, right? There is nothing like what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. And, and of course, this verse is talking about um, the Lord being crucified for our sin. He offered himself, it says. And uh, that sacrifice was an answer to the ends of the law that we couldn't provide. And so he made that first and, and, and most wonderful and significant step. And then in return, we have uh, a response of sacrifice. And that's described here in the next verse. And so this is 3rd Nephi now, uh, 920. And it says, and ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. So a beautiful promise, a powerful promise. And you might say uh, a significant uh, invitation or, or um, uh, you know, beckoning here that the Lord gives us, that we would sacrifice and ultimately surrender our will. You know, it, it's not something that's, that comes easy to the flesh, right? Uh, so that kind of gets us started. And I, I, I have another scripture here that, um, <clears throat> a set of verses actually in the fifth chapter of Alma. So that will kind of even further establish our, our subject here tonight. And then maybe we can pause for some comments and discussions, because as you know, I really think of my lessons more as, as discussions than, than lessons uh, that we're having together. And um, I think there's a lot of benefit in that, that we learn from each other. So in Alma 527, I'll, I'll start with this though. And it says, have ye walked keeping yourselves blameless before God? Could you say, if you were called to die at this time, within yourselves that ye have been sufficiently humbled? And I'll just pause there um, halfway through here to say that, you know, this verse is sort of hearkening to some of the earlier verses we read. This is the sacrifice that we would humble ourselves. And, you know, the, the invitation of, you know, making the choice, it says, choose ye this day, right? It says that with that urgency this day, because this is the day we have, a day of living, of being in the flesh, in that state of probation. And that is the state by which we can make the choice. We have this free will. And it says here, um, you know, if that time runs out, if we were called to die, then that time to make that choice has passed. And so there's, uh, you know, certainly um, an urgency to address that choice. And so um, 
again, the sacrifice is that we would be humble. And he says that your garments have been cleansed and made white through the blood of Christ, who will come to redeem his people from their sins. And Alma says, now he goes on a little bit in detail and talks about what it is that we're emptying ourselves of. He says, behold, are ye stripped of pride? I say unto you, if not, ye are not prepared to meet God. Behold, ye must be prepared, ye must be prepared quickly, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand, and such a one hath not eternal life. And so again, I think this is really putting before us the need to uh, do this process of emptying ourselves and filling ourselves. It's an ongoing thing. And he says, behold, I say, is there one among you who is not stripped of envy? I say unto you that such a one, again, is not prepared. And I would that he should prepare quickly, for the hour is close at hand. And he knoweth not when the time shall come, for such a one is not found guiltless. And you know what a beautiful thing it is, right, uh, brothers and sisters, to, to put yourself before the Lord in that mode of surrender and know that you have laid yourself out before him and you have done your best to remove these things that Alan was talking about because you have a relief and a hope in that moment. And as you hold on to that enduring faith, your hope grows because you know that you have heeded the word of God. And so it's a, a wonderful um, feeling to have as we do these things. And uh, just a few more here and we'll, we'll pause. He says, and again, I say unto you, is there one among you that doth make a mock of his brother or that heapeth upon him persecutions? And so now he's talking about, you know, are we at peace with one another? Do we have love for one another? Do we have compassion and patience and, and grace and mercy uh, for our brothers and sisters? He says, if not, woe unto such a one, for he is not prepared. And the time, he says again here, is at hand, that we must repent or he cannot be saved. Yea, even woe unto all ye workers of iniquity. Repent, repent, for the Lord God has spoken it. Behold, he sendeth an invitation unto all men for the arms of mercy are extended towards them. And he saith, repent, and I will receive you. And so, you know, I, I come up with these titles to try and put new spins on things, but this is what the scripture says more beautifully than, than I could. And it's the explanation the scriptures give us of what it is to empty ourselves of sin and fill ourselves with Christ. It says, you know, repent. Repent of all works of iniquity. And of course, those who don't, it, it has this stern warning, but those who do, don't they have the opposite, a beautiful hope? Um, and so I'm going to pause there on that verse before we get any further. Uh, any thoughts or comments so far? I know I've kind of laid out quite a bit of uh, scripture and, and comments. Can't help but think of Martin Luther, hmm. who in his day was reacting to the religious authorities of the land. And this is still alive today. That's why I'm thinking about it. That, that certain men might stand between you and God. Hmm. If they had had these verses, think, think about that. What, how rich we are today. If they had had these verses, how many souls would have been saved? Because it says, repent and I will receive you. Mm. You know, that answers the whole question that Martin Luther put to the, the authorities of the day. They were collecting alms, as we know, to forgive your sins. And, and it was a terror, it was an abomination. But that was the law of the land. 
and people were persecuted mightily for I don't know, I don't know how long, certainly uh, many many decades. But if they had had these words, Jeremy, it would have changed the face of the the religious world at the, at that time. They are powerful words, right? And and they do lay out the um, you know somewhat insignificant uh, form the the path to salvation. So Brother yeah. Jeremy, yeah. Um, hi, Go this ahead. is Sister Renee. Um, yeah. I as you were reading this, I thought of Psalms fifty one, um, where David was repentant after his sin. Um, with Bathsheba and killing her husband. And the words that uh, kind of stood out to me was um, in verse nine through um, 12, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. And I thought it kind of it, it kind of shows that David had that understanding of the relationship of um, he, had, he, he recognized his fault. He wanted to restore the spirit of God within him. He wanted his heart to be right again. He knew that the Lord could do that for him. And it was a matter of humbling himself and crying and asking, for that and it's and it's that simple yet it can be come difficult for us because of our human nature to not want to yield or submit or um release ourselves of these things that that are disturbing our spirit yeah, so beautiful i love those words and i've used them in my own prayers <laughs> i've used david's words as i've you sure. know come before the lord wanting that you know, that renewal. And I love that particularly that line, create me a clean heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was just going to say, yeah. it's okay. Oh. I was just going to say that pride is, um, is mentioned first. And that's the difference between, mm -hmm. you know, what, you know, what we can be and what David was, he was humble. He mm -hmm. recognized mm -hmm. his weaknesses. He rec we recognized his um frailty his fail his failures and he he wasn't prideful in that moment and it's it's um it's the pride that separates us i think the most and pride mentions, mentions first there first. can i make a comment yeah please um it, i've been looking at brother jerry valenti's blog post um of a week ago when he talked about blessed are they that mourn and we all assume that it's people who've mourned loss but um what's really struck me because i needed to hear it uh is that even believers can fall into sin at times and they need to reach the point point of mourning their sinful condition mm -hmm. and they break their hearts before the lord and seek his forgiveness so this goes exactly right along with what you're saying that um you know the lord will He'll, become, he'll comfort us. We don't always do right all the time, but we can mourn uh, our, falling, our falling apart or our, our missteps, but um, he'll, he'll, he'll forgive us. That's very good. Um, and I, I think there are components to repentance. One is acknowledging you know, the sin, understanding the commandments and following them. So you turn from that sin, right? And, and one is repenting by asking for forgiveness, but then there's a, a sorrow, a penitent heart, right? And that, that's a beautiful way to put it, to, to mourn for your sins, that you might understand um, the impact, the weight uh, that they carry, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think I found it interesting um, um, when in Elmer fifth chapter and you begin with uh, Christ requiring a broken heart and contrite spirit. And so you go into the Elmer, it begins to say, I like to say the requirement of that broken heart and contrite spirit, as my sister said, put you into repentant spirit. So he's showing us a pathway of characteristics to be in our mind and body that 
it's like you will hoard sin, like Elma said, I will hoard sin. And that that sin will be a hoard because what you're experiencing here will lift you from that. And you have no desire to be in that. You have a desire to be with your brother and your sister that you don't put them in the state like anything that you should do since you're supposed to be representing Christ. And you're supposed to be representing this broken heart and contrite spirit. So it gives us a way to look at it within ourselves and without ourselves and how we relate to one another in the gospel, professing to have this love of God. And this love should transcend any type of thing we think we have by these examples to raise us up. Yeah, I like that. It's internal and external, and that realization of that adds richness uh, to our endeavor to um, serve the Lord for our sake, but for the sakes of others too, right? Yes. And, and I think yes. of that often. It's like if I um, if I am serving God and setting a good example, it's not just good for me. It's also good for those who see. And, you know, I think that's also relevant in, in Lynette's comment about pride. You know, it did start with pride and the stripping of pride. And, you know, the thing about pride is that it's contagious, right? If, yes. if, uh, if you're prideful, you kind of invoke that of someone else. And, and yet, isn't the character of God uh, also contagious? Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful comments. Um, thank you. I've got uh, not a whole lot of, of slides tonight, but I'll share just a little bit more here. And uh, we're kind of still uh, on this uh, phase of being emptied, right? And uh, so this is my last, uh, we could go on further, but this is my last uh, verse for that part. Um, I forgot to include the reference here, I see, but uh, this is Alma talking to his uh, son, and I believe somewhere around maybe the 39th chapter. But anyway, it says, um, and now my son, I desire that ye should let these things trouble you no more, and only let your sins trouble you. With that trouble, which should bring you down unto repentance. Now, I, I want to take this verse apart a little bit, because there's a few significant takeaways uh, that, that are so beneficial here for us. Um, first, it says, let these things trouble you no more. What sorts of things trouble us? You know, and I, I said, you know, earlier, something to this effect as well, that what we're emptying ourselves of is not just the sin, but all the grief and trouble that comes with it. And even the uh, fearful anticipation, right, of the consequences of our sin. And so what a beautiful thing, you know, and are we troubled by the wrong things? That might be another way to, uh, to t you know, to apply this, right? You know, in the example here, he's thinking about questions that he has, right? But you, you could really take this broadly and say, well, what sorts of things trouble us today? And um, are they really worth our concern? What's the, uh, uh, the saying? Don't sweat the small stuff, right? Because in comparison, th th those things really don't matter in, in the big picture, right? And then he says, um, only let your sins trouble you. So he really narrows down the focus. You know, what should bother or disturb us? really nothing except those things which would separate us from God. Everything else we're permitted to not worry about, right? In fact, we're asked, we're, we're requested of God not to worry about those things. Fear not, don't worry, don't fret, don't doubt, let go of all of those concerns and, uh, you, you know, be careful for none of those things, right? That, that's the message that we get in the scriptures. But if we have something that would harm us spiritually, there's where our focus, um, in terms of being concerned, you know, that, that's something we should be concerned about. But not for the sake of being burdened and, and, and uh, in misery, right? Rather, what this verse is describing is temporary. Not that we would carry this burden of trouble 
for a long time, but that we would let that trouble bring us down to repentance. Because what happens next? When we repent, we are freed of the burden. And how beautiful is that? That we might, you know, be delivered from that trouble, that weight that would weigh down our, our hearts. And so, um, you know, I think that there's sort of hidden within this verse some permissions to not worry. And if we do worry, that it would be temporary because that worry brings us closer to God. So these verses are insisting that in some way that we don't understand, our sins do a good work if we allow it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is a really strange, I never really thought about that. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing to suffer the frailties of life, like, like death, for instance, your mother dies, your father dies. And we all suffer these things. And uh, that's one thing. And, and we have to wrestle with that. But this says that our sins will bring us to repentance. Uh, that, that's amazing to me. Uh, it, it's true, I, I'm sure, but I never thought of sin doing any good. But apparently it can. Yeah, it sort of... Um goes with other scriptures too right you know for example the the scripture says uh that the lord gives us weakness right and that weakness humbles us and teaches us reliance upon the lord and and there's other scriptures too that say you know praise god for trials in so many words right uh because of what they teach us right and certainly the lesson isn't um to stay in that condition but it's the message of, of change, you know, that we would uh, learn from, from those experiences and become better for it, right? right. You know, I, I think in terms of two things going on here. One, he's looking at the troubles that he's bringing before him. And he said, you should be focusing on, as even Bob said, the trouble of your sin. This, this is where your focus should be. If you focus on that, then the word of God will bring you into repentance. Those other things won't bring you nowhere. And just like you just said, when we separate ourselves from the reality that we're dealing with, we're not looking at the looking out the outside, so looking inside, looking at what so what is separate me from the love of God. What is separating me that I'm troubled? When I focus on that, then I can see the power of sin that I can cast it out. Because my focus is on it. And I'm understanding what God is telling me. And, and the salvation is more than just the atoning blood, Christ hanging on the cross. It's a day-by-day -day salvation. And in that, I find the comfort of the Lord or in the cool of the day that I'm talking about these things. God is beginning to bless me and free me and give me understanding. Therefore, I gain life and strength. I'm able now to see it and overcome it because I'm recognizing that the power of the word of God is giving me the strength to overcome it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, you're right. Dr. Jeremy. Uh, uh, oh. A good lesson. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so if you're, if you're troubled, is that a sin in itself? I think, you know, that the message was... Um, aimed at this idea that that really that trouble is guilt right there's sin that needs to be dealt with and so you're feeling trouble until you repent of that sin and and from that point of repentance that trouble would be no more brother jeremy i think uh, like in the 30th verse it gives us gives us a little more understanding and i agree with all the comments that have that I've heard, but um, Elma's son was trying to justify his sin. Yeah, he was. 
he was troubled that there that God has a justice and that there's eternal damnation for the sinner. And he what probably didn't really want to repent and be remorseful for his actions. Um, and I think he had some kind of an affair with a harlot or something. He, he was trying to justify those actions. Now, unlike David, who David recognized, oh no, I've sinned before God, I've come short, I need to, to change my heart. Alan wanted to live and go on living. I, his son wanted to be able to live with those sins. So um, that's, that was what was troubling him is why is God so just? Why is there, why is there punishment for sin? And, um, and his father's like, you should be more concerned about your sin and getting rid of that and making yourself right with God than trying to question God and what God's plan is for us. Yeah, I think those two comments are, are good to point out that there's a right kind of trouble and a wrong kind of trouble that we can feel uh, within uh, our hearts, right? Uh, yeah, and this is, by the way, the 42nd chapter, Alma's lecture to his son uh Corianton. Corianton, yeah um this is that same chapter that talks about mercy not robbing justice mm. mm -hmm. yeah so yeah a good kind of a lesson within a lesson there you know to kind of understand how these things bring us closer to the lord um great comments um okay so we're we're shifting gears now into the uh well, I don't know. You might argue that both these uh, sections are positive, but perhaps this one's a little more positive. The filling up, right? After we empty, <laughs> we, we can fill uh, with good. We empty the bad and fill with good, right? And so um, I, I wanted to start us off in, in Matthew, and it says in Matthew 23, and I have a few verses in the 23rd chapter here, but in the 11th verse, he says, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted and that was the portion i kind of you know picked out as a theme for tonight because i feel like it sort of uh, captures so much of what we're talking about which is to say that our 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 theme really is about humility, about admitting we're wrong. And, and that's where Corianton was struggling, right? He was trying to justify himself instead of humbling himself. And, um, you know, when we humble ourselves, it says the Lord will lift us up. And so, again, I'm, I'm kind of rehearsing this idea that when we sacrifice to God, when we follow his example of sacrifice, and we surrender our will, we're giving something up, but really, we're gaining. We're gaining more than we're giving, for sure. And, and it says, you know, that much in this verse, that as we humble ourselves, he lifts us up. And we want to be lifted up, not by ourselves, but by the Lord. Uh, and blessed, in other words, you know, I, I think that's sort of a broad way to think of being exalted, you know, being blessed of the Lord with all those good things that he has in store. And so there's a reward for sacrifice. And, and that's the good, uh, perhaps a good uh, thing to focus on as we uh, endeavor to do this more and more in our lives. And so, um, and you're probably familiar with this verse, I thought maybe it'd be a uh, relevant tonight um we need to fill that void right and, and these verses in luke 11 it says when the unclean spirit is gone out of man he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none he says i'll return to my house from whence i came and and when he cometh he findeth it swept and garnished and then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So um, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on these verses. Um, for, for me, you know, to maybe kick it off, I just think that um, if we try to repent and remove from ourselves sin, 
but we don't replace that void in our lives with something good. We end up being weak. And so it's very important to understand both steps, right? It's not just this, this self-inflicted punishment of surrendering all things of the flesh that we're focusing on. It's, it's a two-part process, both extremely part, uh, important, right? That we would be sure to not just empty of what's bad, but also be filled with what's good. And we need that strength of the Lord to maintain ourselves in that, that condition of repentance, of, of righteousness. And so I, I guess my takeaway from these verses is that um, we can do so when we are, are filling ourselves with the Lord and with his strength we can, we can maintain. Any other thoughts on that? When, when we sin and we lose out on gifts and blessings, we, we don't get those back. They're gone. Mm -hmm. So we have to strive for new, new blessings and more gifts by being righteous. Mm -hmm. That's the consequence. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm thinking that I'm, <clears throat> I'm looking at the scripture and it's an unclean spirit is going out of a man. He walketh through a dry place and seek rest and find none. He says, I returned to my house once I came out. So God cleaned, cleaned his house. He purified his house. My mind says, well, why didn't you turn to God? Why didn't you come back to one who cleansed your house? And then your house is clean. Then you go take on seven other spirits. So you were not happy with the things of God. So what, so what are we really saying? That when God opens the doorway for us for repentance, we should take it. Because there is no other rest we can find but in the house of God. And we don't come back to the word. We, we bring greater sins upon ourselves. For whatever reason we think we can do without. I just, this, this, this hits me strange when I read the scriptures. Because it's, it's, it's telling us something how the spirit of God can take care of us. If we don't follow the spirit of God, we're wandering and we're looking for a rest. We can find no rest. There's no rest out there. That you leave yourself open for other spirits to enter you and make you worse than you were before. There's some thoughts that go through my mind. I look at the scripture. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, Brother Clifton. This, these are peculiar verses and um, you know, I've often thought that about this passage, like, what, what is this really about, right? And, and maybe to add one more element to it, I think that if you say, well, look, I've got this vice, right? And, and it's a, a, an issue of, of the flesh. And I try to give it up. <laughs> you know, maybe uh, the old uh, dieting or quitting smoking, these are famous examples of things, right, that are very difficult for people to okay. follow through on. And when you try it and fail, the lesson that you learn is not a good one, right? You, you learn that, well, I can't do it. But at the same time, uh, the real crux, the importance, I think, of this is that we don't lean upon our strength, but upon the strength of God. Mm -hmm to change who we are. We don't want to come away with the wrong lesson that, well, I tried and failed. And so now I'm even less likely to try again or with the same fervor that I did the first time. See that that's the wrong takeaway. And I think that's the ending state of this, you know, example, this, the person in this example. And so um, instead, right, we want to rely upon the Lord. And, and so this is really all about faith. This is a test of faith. I have to step out in faith and say, the Lord can do for me and, and through me and in me what I cannot myself. The flesh is weak. Okay, very good. And so going on a little further now in, in Matthew 23, uh, this is the 23rd verse. Um, he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise 
and common and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. So I have a picture here of these spices. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how much you would pay for these, uh, right? But they're not really heavy and they're not really worth a lot, right? In fact, these were known as not necessarily uh, the, the most important spices even. They were pleasant, they smelled nice, but they weren't really serving a greater purpose. And so, you know, again, this I think relates to the wrong focus. And sometimes what we do is we put our energy into things that aren't as important. Maybe we put our energy into appearances um, or, you know, what mankind has often done is, is put an importance on ritual and tradition. And, and there are weightier things that the Lord wants us to focus on that are more important. And so, you know, what are those things? You know, that, that it begs the question, right? What are the weightier things? And so as we go on in the verse, it says judgment, mercy, and faith these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. And so, you know, we, we want to do all the will of God, but we want to start with these, these more significant things and the blessings of God then come and, and we are strengthened to do more in the Lord. Um, and I think that's, you know, I kind of, left this stock image of the buildings but it's certainly they're weightier they're heavier but they're founded right you have to have a foundation to build up and uh, so these are fundamental building blocks for us um, that would lead us then on to um, even more things and so he goes on in that same chapter and he says ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So, I, you know, th this is kind of a little bit of a... Uh, uh, another spin on this but the idea here is that if we're going to empty if we're going to clean our cup and empty it these are some of the things that we have to get rid of these things of vanity um and you know i, I would say that this is also an example of something that you you start with you it's something you work on uh between you and god to kind of build these 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 building blocks in your life and it's not something necessarily that you do for uh, uh an appearance or or for your reputation it's kind of between you and the lord you're working on you know becoming a, a better person and so um you know the warning again and again here is don't worry about what you appear to be um, externally, but worry about who you really are inside. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be authentic about emptying ourselves and filling ourselves within of good things. We can't just go through the motions. And so, you know, this is sort of repeated again when he says, uh, whoa, again, to them for being hypocritical because they're like whited sepulchers, uh, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones. It's kind of like a tomb that looks pretty on the outside, but you don't want to open that thing <laughs> um, because it's full of uncleanness. And so he's saying, even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And so they didn't fully empty. That's the point, right? If you want to be filled with Christ, you've got to fully empty yourself of that which is not Christ because sin displaces righteousness and righteousness displaces sin and you have to choose one or the other okay so i've got our song for tonight but let me uh, pause there <laughs> um 
any thoughts comments before we start to wrap up and uh sing a related hymn <laughs> i had another related hymn that i thought that that as soon as you we started the topic tonight, the song came to me and, that, and that's 55 checking on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we have to really look at ourselves inwardly to be able to um, move forward spiritually. Yeah. I, and I'll say, you know, in, in full candor, it's a struggle. You know, these things are not easy to do, but, but putting your full effort into them is, is a joy. It feels so good, right? To, to feel like, hey, I'm really sincerely serving God. I'm really trying, you know, to, to draw near him. I think, I think we, can all, we can also see it that, you know, when someone has first coming to Christ, it, it, you can see the change. But, you know, we've got, a, I've got a lot of years behind me and I have to do this all the time. <laughs> Like maybe I'm more stubborn than most, but it, it's like an ongoing process. And that's, you know, thank you for tonight because it's not just that initial commitment, but how you got to check yourself mm -hmm. and the Lord's okay. He's okay with it. As long as you just keep checking yourself, he's going to just keep you going. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So true. Um, you're living out that decision and making it more and more um, real as you go, I think. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll I, I really wish everyone could be here singing with me. I'll tell you, I feel kind of funny singing by myself sometimes. So feel free to join in some way, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I underline some hymns, though, um, lines of the hymn that I think are uh, really helpful in this lesson. And I, I, I did find the hymn after I started preparing things, but I was struck by how, how well it, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the lines here fit and add to, you know, what we're, what we're talking about. Hopefully this is all visible for you here. Soul, soul, soul. 
singing with you. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was a perfect love... song for that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I also thought of other songs too, like the higher spiritual mind, you know, and, and I thought that was, uh, you know, keeping well with the theme, but, but that one line, hold out the vessel of your heart, right? And we empty it first. That's how we come and, and approach the Lord. We empty it of sin and then hold it out and then he comes to fill it up. I thought that was just a beautiful, such a beautiful part of that song. Okay, let me open that back up again. Um, that's all I've got. And so unless there's less thoughts, uh, may God bless you tonight and I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, our brother, Walt. Well, I just want to also say that I could think of so many things in my life that I could not have done on my own. But I have definitely had to put it back onto, into Christ's hand and he took care of it. Some things that I had tried and tried. And um, I just praise him for that. Amen. Well, I think after the lesson tonight, I think we've all got some things to do this week. And I'd like taking some inventory. Uh, Sister Carolyn said it, checking ourselves, you know, and, and, and seeing just what might be there inside of us that hold us back from uh, realizing the, you know, the total blessing that God can give us. So um, let's, uh, let's take the challenge, if you will, and, and uh, just check ourselves and, and, and see what we can empty of, of the bad things that could be in us and, and hindering the spirit of God to be with us and looking at what we can fill it up with going forward and seeing if we don't have a brighter day ahead of us as a result. So again, thank you for uh, the participation tonight and thank you for, again, the, the lesson and the focus that we had as well. So I appreciate that. So wish everybody a good week and uh, uh, just take care of yourselves and be safe. Brother Cliff, could you wrap us up tonight in prayer? Yes, I can, my brother. Thank you. Let us bow our heads. We thank you, right, your Father, this evening for bringing that word to us, O oh, Father, that we may look within ourselves, the vessel with our tabernacle, that we may understand, O oh, Lord, our goings and coming. We ask, O oh, Father, that you look down to remember here, O oh, Father, who touched all of our lives, that we may give utterance to that holy name, O oh Lord, and things that we stand in need of because of the glory of thy spirit has given us. You manifest thy will through thy ministry, O oh Father, and through thy people, Lord, that we learn from one another. And we come, O oh Lord, we may sit at that tree of life, and we may understand, Lord, the glory of word that God has given to us, that we may be better saints one to another, Lord, more importantly, walk upright before thee. And walking upright, O oh Lord, the glory of God may shine forth onto others that we may attract. So we thank you, Father, for your blessing to bring us into remembrance things that we should do. We thank you, Father, for the love we have to desire these things, that we may have an understanding of, Lord, how we should go in and how we should go out, that the glory of the Lord may always be with us. And we will never grieve the Spirit of God, knowing for surely, Lord, thou are able in any given situation where you can help thy saints to call upon thee, O Lord. So we thank you, Lord, that our hearts will always be open to thee, O Lord, that we may empty out the sin, O Lord, and that I may fill it, O God, with the glory of thy holy word. That we may walk right, O Father, and understand thy ways, O Lord. We desire, O righteous Lord, to dwell in the house of the Lord this day. O righteous Father, we ask thy blessings and all these things, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.